2010 al 2013 il dottor Graham è stato membro del comitato esecutivo della US Patent Trademark Office come Chief Economist, mentre in quella posizione si è occupato di creare un team di economisti professionali per studiare il sistema dell'innovazione negli Stati Uniti e per guidare la politica economica del governo. Il dottor Graham è inoltre un avvocato e può esercitare nello Stato di New York, negli Stati Uniti e continua dopo questo periodo in cui è stato in pianta stabile al VSPTO a eh, fornire i suoi servizi come Special Advisor all'Ufficio Brevetti e Marchi Americano e al Dipartimento del Commercio del Governo degli Stati Uniti. Professor o Dr. Graham, it's up to you. Thank you very much and, um, and thanks everyone here for um, suffering through, uh, through my English uh, my English presentation. So um, uh, I, I did want to, before beginning, uh, just quickly thank uh, Giacobacci, Parembo, and the people here at uh, Chilomito Rosa. Um, grazie. Um, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. I was asked, uh, since I'm the, the uh, kickoff speaker, to help set the stage for today's discussion. And um, I'll do that uh, by speaking a bit about uh, what we know as economists about the innovation process, but also, again, forgive me to um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the United States' um, approach to issues of technology transfer. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that as I, as I go forward. So in terms of the, the economics underlying technology transfer, um, one, of the, one of the most important concepts is the concept of, of uh, specialization. Um, so this goes back uh, at least as far as, uh, as David Ricardo, Adam Smith into the 1700s. Um, in which uh, the idea is, is that by specializing, by economic actors specializing and then trading amongst themselves, uh, we, uh, we as, a, as a society can experience more efficient outcomes. This concept has been um, brought into the, into the current way of thinking about, uh, about technology and markets um, recently by a set of scholars, uh, Laura Foscuri, um, and here pictured is uh, Alfonso uh, Gambradella. Uh, uh, Professor Gambradella is uh, at uh, Bocconi in Milan. Um, and they've recognized the benefits that flow in a modern innovation economy from specialization and creating an environment in which technology can transfer among economic agents. And in this context, uh, intellectual property and patents uh, play a significant role. Because not only from an economic perspective does intellectual property create an incentive to invest today with some promise of returns tomorrow, but um, as uh, Professor Zavora, Foscuri, and Gambradella point out, it also provides a platform for trading uh, in technologies um, and, and licensing, of course, as well, uh, thus allowing these markets for technology to develop. Another important concept that <clears throat> we have as economists so when thinking about uh, um, innovation is the disconnection, um, the separation of the invention process from innovation itself. Um, at least as far back as, uh, as uh, Josef Schumpeter, an uh, Austrian economist, uh, writing in the early parts of the last decade, um, recognized that invention, the creative spark, is a different thing from the innovation process itself. Innovation being, the, or at least described by Schumpeter, as the commercialization process. 
all of those processes uh, that must be done taking the idea and getting it successfully into a marketed product. Famously, one great example of this uh, um, from the UK, uh, from the early 1800s, was James Watts and the, um, and the steam engine that brought forth uh, um, the motive capacity that drove the Industrial Revolution. And um, Watts actually worked on the conceptualization for 20 years. And famously, it was financiers and, and essentially venture capitalists during that 20 years who funded the development process that led ultimately to a commercializable product uh, in, the, in the steam engine. And interestingly, uh, this fellow Bolton um, demanded patents along the way. So when we think about the innovation process and the tech, tech transfer process, this is a very simple schematic of, um, of that process. Um, you have startup firms. Um, they start with some uh, technological uh, um, capability, um, some resources and technology, um, sometimes homegrown, but also oftentimes licensed in, uh, possibly from a university. Of course, there's development along the way. Oftentimes, more patents, more technologies are created, developed, sometimes more licensing. It's not uncommon, for instance, in the United States for technology startups from universities to uh, uh, go through a series of licenses in which uh, different technologies are being developed in the lab collaboratively oftentimes with the startup and then being licensed out from the university over time. Of course, um, important aspects uh, during the development commercialization process include funding of capital, um, which oftentimes in the United States rides on the back of intellectual property protections, managerial and technical support, and of course, information as, uh, as uh, uh, the uncertainty about what the market will bear is resolved over time during the development process. So what about the role of the university in innovation? Um, well, here's the point at which I, uh, I uh, must apologize um, that I'm going to revert back to my experience uh, and talk to you a bit about the US system. Um, in some sense, uh, uh, I am the drunk man um, searching for uh, his keys under the lamppost, uh, even though they might be across the room. And why am I searching under the lamppost? Well, that's where the light is. Right? Um, so for me, the light uh, is in the United States. Um, I, I do think that the comparison and a comparative perspective is useful. It can bring clarity to us. But before I begin talking about the United States, I do want to say that um, we must always understand that national innovation systems are different. We live uh, in various countries under different sets of rules, um, different, different social and cultural influences, and every country uh, must adopt the set of policies that are best suited to its unique system of innovation. By the same token, as an economist, I say there are still some underlying economic facts and rules um, that, uh, that, that drive um, a lot of similarity about the way in which these things play out over different countries. So I want to report a bit about what the role of different types of technical information are um, that are generated in the university and how they find their way into industry in the United States. This is a rather famous study done approximately 20 years ago, um, uh, so keep that in mind when interpreting this. Uh, but this, this study done by uh, researchers at Carnegie Mellon University asked uh, industry R&D managers about the value of different types of information, technical information, that was flowing out of essentially universities. 
out of public investments in research and development and ask them how important or relevant these different types of information were to industrial R&D. And you can see uh, more important, um, or at least very or moderately important, reported by the, uh, by the R&D managers, are things like publication, informational interaction among the parties, meetings and conferences. And down lower in the list are things like patents and licenses. But to make sure that we don't, uh, you know, I put this slide up to make you understand that the university industry relationship is a very thick one. It's a very important one. And there are many ways in which technological knowledge spills out into industrial R&D. But just so that we don't get the idea from this chart that patents and licenses are unimportant, I show you here um, that in certain sectors, patents and licenses tend to be substantially more important. So if you look, for instance, at uh, things like chemicals or drugs, um, the response rate of how important patents coming out of public expenditures, so universities, uh, government research labs, are to the drugs industry, industrial, uh, uh, industrial R&D, is quite important, as are licenses at 33%. And in the bottom panel here of Table 4, you can see that across uh, medical instruments, semiconductors, etc., etc., these sources are certainly not unimportant. And my sense is, my experience in the United States, that this is, of course, 20-year-old data, that patenting and licensing has even become much more important in industrial R&D coming out of the university. Can I have a time check uh, just to make sure that I'm uh, I'm still on time? About how much time? Uh, uh, considering we start later, we still get about almost 15 minutes. Uh, 15 minutes, perfect. I can well. definitely do it. <laughs> okay. 12 minutes. Uh, 12 minutes, <laughs> OK. That, uh, I, can, I, can, uh, I can do it. I can do that, too. OK. So I, I'm now going to show you some data. Um, some up-to-date data, not 20-year-old data, um, along three primary bases that are related to, um, in the United States, to the relationship of the university to industry and the innovation process. Um, what I'm going to show you are, um, are some data on investments in basic R&D. Um, these primarily in the past in the U.S. have come from the government, although, as you'll see, increasingly, industry has been involved itself in funding what happens in the university. Also, I'll show you some statistics about the, um, the growth, the phenomenon of technology transfer offices in the United States, and also some data on uh, the measures we have of successful commercializations. These so are licensing, new company startups, and spin-outs uh, uh, from, from industry, from university to industry. So here are two charts uh, uh, running up. Uh, they were published in 2012 in uh, uh, the Science and Technology Indicators uh, by the US uh, National Science Foundation. And uh, these run through 2012, and they show the, the measure of, um, of uh, uh, science and engineering, that's SNE, science and engineering R&D expenditures over time, both in uh, current dollars and in constant dollars. And you can see that uh, federally funded R&D across all science and engineering activity in the United States has grown substantially um, over the course of several, several uh, decades. Um, and um, it's interesting, too, to see the non-federal uh, investments also, the black line on the left-hand side, grow. Uh, in terms of um, academic science and engineering R&D expenditures, you can see that the federal portion of that has actually been shrinking over time, with an increase, as you see, um, in the academic institutions themselves. So these are, these are funding that, that, that is coming either from tuition sources or also uh, increasingly common uh, from philanthropy, 
uh, philanthropy on projects coming into the university. Um, and you can see that, uh, that business, while um, important, is still a relatively small part of that. Even though clearly, on the left-hand side, you can see that non-federal business investment in R&D, which is generally internally focused, right, industry focused, has been growing substantially over time. Here are some charts that give you a sense of what's happening in terms of academic patenting in the United States. Uh, you can see here uh, on the left-hand figure um, that the number of uh, USPTO uh, patent grants, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office grants, uh, to universities had grown substantially through, through the 2000s and then basically flatlined for uh, the better part of the decade. At the same time, though, you can see in the dotted line um, that uh, um, non-U.S. universities uh, have been taking a more active part in patenting in the United States. Also, the chart on right gives you another sense of, uh, of where that is in terms of the, the overall shares of patents granted in the United States. Still a relatively small share, something around 3% of all grants, right? But again, um, non-US universities in gray um, taking a more active role at, in the US. To give you some sense of where this patenting is happening, um, this gives you um, some sectoral differentiation. So you can see that by and large, over time, much of the action has been on the left-hand side in the biotechnology and pharma space. Um, and this is indeed when we look at the returns to universities from technology transfer, technology licensing. Um, these have been disproportionately in the biotech um, and pharmaceutical space. Nevertheless, there is some, there's still a you know a um, an active role in universities in patenting in other engineering disciplines, right? from materials, medical, women's semiconductor, optics, measurement. So of course, this phenomenon of technology transfer offices in the United States. Um, Grew, has grown over the last 30, 35 years in response to um, a major change in the law in the United States. I'm sure many of you know about the, the Bayh-Dole Act um, of 1980. Prior to 1980, it was more difficult to get patents on federally funded research in universities. But nevertheless, big important projects did find their way into the patenting regime. Things like uh, the Cohen Boyer patent, uh, the original uh, PCR uh, uh, technology that, that really provide the, 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 the fountainhead for the biotechnology revolution. But in 1980, uh, there was this uh, um, there was this change, this legal change in the United States that significantly loosened regulations on university patenting, and as a result, um, it, uh, it it spawned the creation of dedicated technology transfer or technology licensing offices in universities in the United States. Also, it's relevant to look at the patenting rules in the US. Uh, generally, the United States has been, um, uh, has, has been open to patenting in new emerging areas of technology, such as uh, biotechnology, in 1980, famously, um, human engineered life forms were, uh, were decided to be patentable. Um, and the development over time in the United States of, uh, of patenting software and business methods, of which there is a substantial amount of, uh, of controversy, uh, even in the United States. It's also true, this is very important, that the United States uh, offers uh, patent fee discounts to both small entities, a 50% discount, and just recently in the new legislation uh, offers a 75% discount on fees to university faculty. So what has this resulted in, in terms of, uh, of, of outcomes? Well, these are uh, statistics reported again by the, the National Academy of Sciences um, as derived from an organization called AUTUM. This is the 
um, the, uh, the, 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 um, the university tech, the association of university technology managers, essentially the managers of these technology licensing offices. And um, across the entire organization, they report, you can see here in blue, invention disclosures over time, uh, over a 10 year period, uh, and over a decade. And um, these are invention disclosures coming into offices from university faculty. Then, of course, the, the, the number of those um, that have been filed at the USPTO for a patent. And this green line at the bottom, the number of those that have been um, uh, uh, actually granted as, as US patents. Now, in terms of this lower green line, one can look at this in several ways. And I probably think, I, I think that both of these are probably going on. On the one hand, right, you might see this growth in applications and see essentially a flatlined um, grant, um, which may suggest to us, and it's probably partly true, that more applications are going in, but the final decision and paying the money to get the patent grant um, is still relatively stable. Um, another phenomenon, though, here, though, is that part of this uptick in university patenting has not yet been reflected in the grants. Because we also know that uh, at the US uh, Patent and Trademark Office, university patents tend to hang around in the system for a much longer amount of time. Um, and that's generally at the, um, at the direction of the university tech grants for offices themselves, because of course development is going on. And so there are opportunities to add to or otherwise update the claims as licensing deals are being worked out um, with partner firms. Five minutes. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect timing. Um, university startup companies. Here's another uh, a measure of universities uh, in the US uh, uh, um, relationship to the commercial uh, uh, um, the commercial world, right? Um, you can see how Autumn has um, reported in the blue, right? Year by year, startup companies formed. And in the red, this is the cumulative number over time. So this would be the survivors, um, the survivors, uh, the survivor companies. And uh, now, now by 2011 at least, reaching uh, 3,500. Clearly during the downturn in the economy, uh, the, the, uh, the, the red line flatlined a bit right, in terms of uh, survival, um, but uh, again, grow. Okay, in my last four minutes, um, let me spend just a couple minutes talking about my own university, uh, Georgia Tech, the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, these, these examples are illustrative of how there's a lot of differentiation in how universities are approaching technology transfer and the role of the university in technology transfer and economic development. This is a program that I actually teach in um, at, uh, at the university. It's called the TIGER program. That stands for Technology Innovation Generating Economic Results. And what this program does, uh, it's uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in the US and it um, takes PhD students in science and engineering and puts them together for two years with MBA students and with uh, law students from uh, Emory University across town in Atlanta. Uh, the law students uh, are derived from uh, the business law tracks and the intellectual property law tracks. And these teams work together for two years on uh, thinking through and um, building a business plan to commercialize the technology that the graduate student, the PhD student in engineering or science, is actually working on in the lab. Um, the, the pedagogical goal here, um, the goal is not necessarily to create startup companies, but it's actually to give the students a rich experience in what it takes to move a nascent embryonic technology to a position of, uh, of commercialization over those two years. 
Um, it's a fascinating program. Different universities have different systems. MIT has a very similar system, but it's much more focused on actually building active startups right, to, to go out into the marketplace. Uh, so there are a lot of ways in which this model um, has been adapted depending on the, the desires of the university. Lastly, and very quickly, um, this is another unit on, um, on Georgia Tech's campus. It comes out of the, uh, the research arm of the campus. Um, uh, this is uh, our Advanced Technology Development Center, the ATDC, um, which is an incubator and an environment uh, built specifically to try to nurture new startup companies. And you can see some of the statistics here, right, since 1986. Uh, this university engine has, a, um, these companies have attracted more than $2 billion in outside capital um, since uh, about the same period. Um, these uh, 150 companies that graduated out of this program have uh, attracted, uh, generated more than $12 billion in revenues. Um, and you can see some of the other uh, statistics here. Um, you have one minute at this point. Thank you. Very successful program. So with my one minute left, we're out of time, let me, uh, let me, let me just uh, run through a summary here. Right. That is that you know, in the United States, the university is really an integral part of our national innovation system. Universities generate invention, but they're also taking an active role in the innovation process. So how is this working, right? What are the approaches? Well, clearly, investments in basic R&D, that's important. Priming the pump, as it were, or fueling the engine. But also, technology transfer offices and then industry themselves are playing an active role. Because the tech transfer offices are playing an important selection role. They're getting these invention disclosures, and they're making selections on what to patent based on their interpretation in working with industry of what's likely to be successful. Right? So patenting is always one of these, these uh, processes, right? These questions about how you compare the cost of patenting to the expected rewards. And of course, with university technology, oftentimes you're working with technologies that are much further away from the commercial frontier. So that's particularly important. And secondly, industry plays a role because they're, of course, choosing to license or not license, so they, too, are playing a pruning role in this process, right? helping to shift and separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were. Lastly, outcomes. What do we get from this process in the US? Well, we get this efficient specialization right, in which those who do things best, the university researchers, do their research, they specialize in invention and innovation, and other areas of the economy can focus on what they do best, commercialization, licensing, et cetera. Right? And beneficially, this creates royalties that flow back to the university so that more resources can flow back into R&D. And of course, the public, which is what we're all really concerned about in the end, is that they receive a steady stream of innovation, improving their lives. Thank you.